I'm, I'm Craig Jones. I um, last year set up a company called Circular Ecology um, and before that I was a consultant at a company called Sustain in Bristol working on carbon footprinting, water footprinting, embodied carbon, life cycle assessments um, in a broad range of sectors but mainly around uh, construction products, materials and uh, buildings. Um, previously to that I was a researcher at the University of Bath where I created um, quite a well-used embodied carbon database for construction materials called the um, Inventory of Carbon Energy Database, um, which is still a well-used database to carbon footprint the construction of whole buildings. But today I'm here to talk about water. So I have just one slide on circular ecology and then I, I move to um, well, actually, I've got a, a section on the, the wet winter that we had in the UK. We obviously had some incredible weather. Um, and then talk about why we should reduce our water use. Then I start to talk about water scarcity before introducing water footprinting, which is a tool that can help us to manage uh, water-related risks within supply chains. Uh, finally, before discussing briefly water footprints of industrial products, uh, materials, etc. So, circular ecology. Uh, main expertise around carbon footprinting, water footprinting, life cycle assessments, research uh, and training. So we've just released some online training courses on life cycle assessment and embodied energy and carbon. But we've, we're here today to talk about water and we've obviously had a very, very wet, wet winter. Um, just got a few collection of pictures here which I'm sure you've, you've seen many of this, this um, over the last couple of months. This is inside some guy's house where you can see the water has, has risen um, halfway up uh, <laughs> the door in his house, which is quite a scary prospect. And then we've had some incredible weather around the sea as well, some huge, huge um, increase in the amount of and the um, power of the waves on the oceans. A lot of people have had to, to work hard to try and protect their properties to keep the water water out. This poor guy is trying to build a, a flood defence around his his house to protect it from, from the water. So we've really had an abundance of, of water, cr creating some really um, powerful images and some really um, uh, poor situations. Incredibly big, um, big waves uh, and um, as you can see, the water is creeping in. So we've had an abundance of water in the UK. Why should we care about reducing this? Why should we reduce our water in the UK? Well, it's not all about us. It's not all about in the UK. We consume a lot of products that are made in other countries around the world. All our building material, not all of our building materials, but a lot of our materials, um, all of our clothes, a lot of our food is grown in other countries around the world. Those uh, production systems consume water and they place stresses on local areas in another country around the world. So because we bought the, the brick, the steel bar, because we bought the t-shirt, because we bought the, the foods, we're the ones responsible for that water consumption. So water footprinting is, is a tool that allows us to look beyond the boundaries of the UK and start to look at the water impacts um, where it actually occurs in a, in a locality. Um, I noticed that Colin also mentioned that water stands in the shadow of carbon, which I, I definitely agree with. I believe once water catches on, it could very quickly become more important than carbon. And there's plenty of reports out there now um, on how water could, could be far more important in the future from some influential bodies. So the Carbon Disclosure Project um, have a water disclosure project. The quote, have a, the quote top left. Um, they stated that their report uh, found that 50% of the companies foresee near-term risks within one to five years, with 39% currently experienced impacts such as disruption to operations from droughts or flooding, declining water quality and increases in water prices. So water is a real risk to, to companies and can cost businesses real money. Um, likewise, the Royal Academy of Engineering produced a report called Global Water Security and Engineering perspective. They stated that the UK industry must show leadership on global water security. Through their global reach, businesses must examine their supply chains and production processes to assess and reduce their water footprint. This should be a core component to the corporate and social responsibility strategies. So th this is showing the importance of examining the supply chain, not just considering how much water you're consuming in your factory, which um, I have to be honest is really the tip of the iceberg when you consider how much water is consumed to make a product, 
also not just considering how much water is consumed directly in the house. So whilst it's good to reduce the amount of water you consume in the house, you know, turn the taps off, not, not use as much water, again that is dwarfed by the water footprint of all the production um, upstream. Likewise, the big management consultancies have all got reports on um, the rising importance of, of water. McKinsey have one called the Global Corporate Water Footprint, where they state that water issues are already seriously disrupting manufacturing supply chains and operational risks will rise. They must first understand their exposure across geographies and across value, supply chains and product portfolios. They recognise it's a risk, but they recognise that companies just don't necessarily understand these risks within their supply chains, where they occur, what the risks are, until they actually happen. So, but we have um, an abundance of water, right? There's, there's, there's the sea and it's a huge amount of water. Well, there are one point, almost 1.4 million cubic kilometres of water on Earth, so there is a huge amount of water. But most of this is salt water or locked up in the glaciers and ice caps. So all of the wa water in the world would be that little, that blue bubble there, um, just above, not just above America, just here. That's what it looked like. It was in one bubble. But only 0.01% of it is available for us to use fresh water that we can use. So it's a much smaller amount. And. I think the, the graph in Colin's presentation showed much better how um, in the future this could be a real issue for us with uh, increasing population demands and increasing wealth of the developing countries, increasing standards of living. Um, we are going to have a shortage of, of water resources on our hands. But water causes a real impact. So over extraction of water causes a real impact. So in Mexico City, the Angel of Independence, which was built in 1910, has had 23 new steps built at its base so that people can reach it since it was first constructed over 100 years ago. Why is this? Well, Mexico City has a huge population and they've over abstracted the groundwater under the city. So over the last um, 100 years, the city has sunk nine meters that's 10 centimeters per year imagine if your house sunk 10 centimeters per year you'd soon start to get worried so that's occurred because they've extra ab abstracted too much of the the water below the city it's really quite a scary impact it also costs money drought and floods cost money these 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 um, show the economic impacts of drought of course economic impacts always uh, speak quite well to businesses. So the 2003 drought in Europe cost 8.2 billion euros. That's quite an impact. The 2007 Barcelona drought cost the Catalan economy 1% of GDP. The 2011 drought in Texas cost 5.2 billion dollars to the local economy and the 2012 drought in the US pushed up the price of wheat around the world. Um, so as you can see, it costs, costs real money to, to um, economies and water scarcity is an increasing risk to economies and supply chains. So, uh, you know, these droughts are costing money and of course the less water that we consume to, to sustain our activities, to make our goods, to uh, run our houses, the, the lower the impact of drought upon, our, uh, upon us. This is a picture originally from the Water Footprint Network who have done some great work in this area. Um, as you see, it's a very arid, very cracked, very dry ground. Just, just take a second and imagine where you, where you think this might be. This is actually a national park in southern Spain. So, this didn't used to be like this, but over irrigation of water for growing of strawberries for export, of which we, we export a lot, import a lot of strawberries here, has caused, has caused this situation here. Likewise, this is a, a former sea, completely disappeared. I'm sure m many of you know, know where it is, but you can see the ships there lying what looks like a completely dry desert. This is the former Aral Sea in Central Asia, where again over irrigation of growing of cotton for export to, to make our t-shirts, our shirts, our clothes, has caused almost an entire sea to almost disappear. There are also signs of global water pollution everywhere. This was an incident in Davaskar, Hungary, back in 2010. That's an aluminium plant, which is a key ingredient to make aluminium. And there was an incident there where uh, the, the picture to the left, that's a toxic chemical sludge. Um, quite nasty stuff. So, 
And again, the signs of global water pollution everywhere, all around us, agriculture, farming, um, everything. It's just some of the signs of the real impacts that water causes. So I always find that quite interesting because carbon gets a lot more attention um, and carbon is more of a global issue. But how many people really understand what a ton of carbon is or what, what damage a ton of carbon does? But we really understand what a meter cubed, a litre of water is or a meter cubed of water. And we understand what the damage is of floods, droughts um, or polluting lakes and rivers. So water has a, a better link between the, the, uh, the cause and the, the impact. Now, I'm going to introduce water footprinting, which is a tool to help manage water-related um, risks or to help us start to understand where there might be issues within our supply chains. So, it shares a name with carbon footprinting, um, but it's actually quite a different concept. Uh, it was a concept first developed by Professor um, Hoekstra from the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And uh, there is um, a very good water footprint manual, which is freely available from the Water Footprint Network, from the web address there, um, that outlines the method of how you water footprint, how you water footprint essentially, anything, products, food, items, anything. It is a developing science and not quite as developed as a carbon footprint, um, but there is an international standard in development, ISO 14046, which is in late stages of development. Should have been out by now, but of course they're always a bit delayed. It should come out this year. Um, so that should help push things forward a, a bit as well. Like a carbon footprint, it's a consumption-based indicator. So when I talk about water footprint, I talk about meters cubed of water. How many meters cubed of water were consumed to make this product? So breaking down a water footprint, we separate it into three classifications of net water consumption. We talk about blue water, green water, and grey water. Um, we express these all in litres or meters cubed of water. So it is consumption based rather than the total amount of water in the system, which means that if a system takes 100 units of water in and puts back 90 units of water, fresh water back into a river, the consumption is 10. It's the difference. It's the losses in the system. So blue water considers how much water we consume from fresh water resources over on the left there. Green water considers how much rainfall we consume um, in the middle there. And now when the first time you come to this, you, you think, why should we care about how much rainwater we consume? But if you go back a few slides to the, the pictures of Spain, the pictures of the Aral Sea, um, uh, overconsumption of rainwater or over irrigation of the, the, the local natural resources means that that water is just being evaporated back up into the atmosphere, which means it's not being run down into the local rivers and lakes. So it can have a real impact on the, the local ecosystem, on local industry, local people. Um, so you do have to be careful as to how much green water you do consume in any one area. Finally, there's a the grey water footprint, which is the, the most abstract and difficult one to understand. Now, it doesn't help that it's, n it's nothing to do with grey water harvesting or how we talk about grey water in construction. The grey water footprint is, is a indicator of how much of a water pollution issue that you have. So to calculate a grey water footprint, you need to look at all the contaminants in the, the water discharge from your, say, your factory, um, from your house. Um, you need to understand all the um, concentrations of contaminants in that water discharge, how, how much there is there, um, and then the grey water footprint is the amount of water that you need to add to that to bring those concentrations of all these um, chemicals uh, back down to safe levels. So it's, it's the amount of fresh water you need to add to your um, polluted water to dilute it back down to um, safe levels. So it's a bit of an unusual concept, but it means that the results are also in a meters cubed of water. So you end up with meters cubed of blue water, meters cubed of grey water, and meters cubed of uh, green water. You can add these up to get a total water footprint. And these are where you get results such as one cotton t-shirt takes about 2,700 litres of water to produce. That's 2.7 metres cubed of water. Imagine that as water bottles. One kilogram of beef, about 16,000 litres of water to produce. Actually, a lot, anything that's grown or um, grown has a, a high water footprint. 
and this one's not a, a true water footprint to water footprint method but each one ton of gold um, taken from the ground uh, used half a million litres of water uh, withdrew half a litre, million litres of water to produce now these are very large numbers and for comparison an average bath is about 80 litres or you'll fill about 80 litres of water to take an average bath it does vary of course and a shower which varies even more about 60 litres so you can see it's great to, to manage the amount of water that we use in our houses but if we really want to get on top of this and we really want to make um, a real impression on where it matters most in, in terms of around the world we need to start looking at the water footprint of our supply chains of our products of what we consume and where the impact really is now I have quite an interesting slide, which is a photo stunt that did last year for World Water Day, UN World Water Day. So that's me sitting on what is a sofa of water bottles. There are 750 litres of water there, and that is the water footprint of how much water it requires to make a cheese sandwich lunch, a cheese sandwich, pack of crisps and a bottle of Coke. So I just ate 750 litres of water. That's also the amount of water that it takes to make a normal cappuccino. Um, these are incredible amounts of water that, that we're consuming and we don't, we don't necessarily realise um, that there's, there's ways that they can be managed. Now, a high water consumption isn't necessarily an issue. It might not be an issue at all. Um, it's like the more, the more money you have, the more you can spend. Um, the more resources you have, the more you can, the more you can use. So, the more water we have, uh, the, more, the more available to use for processes which means we need to consider um, how much water we're using, supply versus demand, how much water we're using and where it's being used. So we need to consider the stress that this demand places on the local water resources. And again, this is where a water footprint really differs from a carbon footprint. So a carbon footprint doesn't consider local issues. It, it barely even touches the subject. Whereas water really is about the, 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 local, uh, the local issues. Water, real water is being consumed from lakes, rivers, seas, um, etc. So you end up uh, taking water footprint data and you create hotspot maps by overlaying the water consumption with local water stress data for the, the part of the supply chain. You end up with, this is just a map of a water stress index. Um, red in indicates highly water stressed, of course, um, down to darker blue, which, which has um, very little water stress. So as you see up in Scandinavia, they don't have so much of a um, water, water issue. Um, but, but then that, that could mean they have more water available to actually manufacture to products, to use hydroelectricity, um, and to take advantage of their abundance of water resources. But then if you overlay the, the water footprint of the goods you're consuming with the supply chains and the locations of where you're consuming things, where they're manufactured, you can end up with these maps of where you are importing virtual water. So this is for the EU, again from the Water Footprint Network. And this shows you from, from the goods that we buy, our impact on blue water resources, fresh water resources, lakes, aquifers, um, etc. So this shows you where we're importing more, more water than, than others. Now, you'll have noticed that I haven't really discussed um, the water footprint of industrial products till now. I haven't really mentioned the water footprint of constructions and buildings um, by now. And that is because there is a real lack of data on the water footprint of industrial products. There is a lack of data on the water footprint of construction materials and there is a lack of data on the water footprint of entire buildings. Now it can be done and we do do it. We have done water footprints and there are people out there doing water footprints for um, construction as well. But there is a lack of data of how much, what the water footprint is of this wood or plastic or steel, concrete, etc. Um, so when I was in my previous job at Sustain, I did secure a technology strategy board grant to start to develop a embodied water water footprint database for building, well, for, for materials and products, not just restricted to buildings, but building materials. Um, the, the, the materials consumed in a building are consumed in a huge range of different sectors as well. Um, so that they secured um, funding for that um, and they're currently exploring further funding options for that. So it would be some time before that could come through to help improve the, the lack of data. 
Um, that's essentially a summary of water, water footprinting. So to, to summarize, water footprinting is still a developing field. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. I don't think it's right for all, all purposes, but it can, it can help us understand um, the water consumption within a supply chain and where it becomes an issue. So we've got, we, we manufacture, we buy materials that are manufactured from all around the world, but supply chains are very complicated. So just because we've got a product and bought it from here in the UK, it could have been in Germany, or India or China uh, uh, or all three um, in, in supply chain. So water footprint can help look at the, the consumption of water in those areas and see where it is an issue now or importantly where it could become an issue in the future. So for example India has quite a, they, they will have quite a big water problem on their hands soon. They already have a huge population for their, their natural um, resources um, but they, they're going to have an even bigger problem in the future. There is, however, an international standard being developed, which is in very late stages of development. It should help somewhat, although of course it takes time for an international standard to become influential. Um, but at this stage we are now, there is a general shortage of data on materials, products and constructions, which is the main barrier to doing water footprints in construction. Um, it's, you can still do studies. Um, uh, and we've done studies for the construction of whole power stations and houses, um, etc. But generally further research and case studies will help to develop this subject further so that there's more interesting case studies to show you just how important water um, consumption is and where the, main, where the main impacts are around the world. Um, thank you.